Testament. And you can see by the words on the screen behind me, I've titled this morning's sermon, From Nothing to Something, a little less provocative than I was initially debating, from reject to elect, which is nevertheless true, and you're going to see that in the text, from nothing to something. Follow along with me as I read verses 1 to 4 in chapter Sorry, 4 to 10 in chapter 2. 4 to 10 of chapter 2. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So, the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe... The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Oprah Winfrey was born to an unmarried teenage household, a housemaid, in a poor rural community in a small town in Mississippi in 1954. Winfrey was raised by her grandmother, who would regularly beat her as part of her strict upbringing. And when her grandmother fell ill, six-year-old Oprah was sent to live with her mother in a Milwaukee boarding house, where she would grow up in extreme poverty, often sleeping on the porch, in the cold, and wearing potato sacks for clothing, because they could not afford clothing. Even more tragically, She endured years of physical and sexual abuse. She was raped for the first time at the age of nine by her 19-year-old cousin, the first of several more horrific incidences. At age 14, Winfrey broke free, and she went to go live with her dad in Nashville, Tennessee, which served as the turning point in her life, living under his direction, his guidance, and his support. And by her senior year at East Nashville High, she had secured a full scholarship to Tennessee State University. She left at the early age of 19 to pursue a career in media, and her gamble paid off. Immediately, she became Nashville's WLAC-TV's first black female news anchor and the station's youngest ever before the age of 20. Soon after, she landed a gig hosting a boring and low-rated morning talk show called AM Chicago. And within a few months, Winfrey turned AM Chicago from the lowest-rated talk show in Chicago to the highest-rated. And three years later, the show was renamed The Oprah Winfrey Show. She made a savvy, career-transforming move in 1986 when she founded her own production company, Harpo. She negotiated ownership of the Oprah Winfrey Show, which brought in $300 million a year during its peak. She launched her own magazine, The Oprah Magazine, started her own radio channel, Oprah Radio, and launched her own cable channel, The Oprah Winfrey Network. And today, Forbes estimates that her net worth is about $3 billion, and she's the only black woman on their list of the 400 richest people in America. 
And now regardless of what you may think of her universalist religion and the pervasive influence that she's had on our culture, you cannot deny that she has come a long way from the girl who grew up wearing potato sack overalls. And everyone loves a rags to riches story. Right? A nothing to something story. But as great of a rags to riches story as that is, there is a far greater, far more heartwarming, pride crushing, soul humbling rags to riches story. And it's your story and my story. God has taken us, nobody, nothing, sinners who deserve death and judgment and chosen us to be his people, his prized possession by faith in his son, Jesus, whom he gave in our place as the price to make us his own people. And through him, we now enjoy all the blessings and privileges of being God's people, the hope of everlasting life and eternal inheritance through his son. Spiritually and eternally speaking, we went from having nothing to having everything. Our story, as blood-bought believers, is the greatest rags-to-riches story, the truest nothing-to-something story ever written. And because of God's doing everything for and giving everything to us, we are to offer up our lives in tangible, real, sacrificial, and serving faith by living our lives through and to Jesus which can only happen by faith in Jesus. This is the purpose for which he called and chose and saved us, to live our lives for him by pouring out our lives in service of him, by proclaiming him, which brings honor and praise and glory only to him. And we've been seeing some of this recently as we've been going through Peter's first letter. He's been focusing a lot on our conduct, how we're to live our lives, our Christian ethic, and as we got to chapter 2, we've seen him continue his exhortation to continue pursuing Christ-like love for one another. Except he put it negatively. What does Christ-like love look like? It looks like not doing these things to your brothers and sisters. You are demonstrating that you truly do love them sincerely and earnestly and purely when you're not malicious to one another, he says. Because malice comes from an impure, wicked heart. Only a wicked person who harbors ill will for someone would want to harm or hurt someone else. He's saying, don't do that. Don't be deceitful. Don't be hypocritical with one another. Don't pretend to be someone to someone's face, but really have a malicious pretext to harm them like a hypocrite. And he says, don't envy one another. Be happy to see someone other than you happy, healthy, and successful in this life, knowing that it is happening by God's sovereign design for their life. So don't be envious. And certainly don't slander them, he says. Don't malign them, don't denigrate them, not to their face, not behind their back. Even if it's true, that's just gossip, and that's a form of slander. And he says, don't have anything to do with that. Instead, he says, long for the pure word of God, by which you were born again, and through which you are grown and nourished into the Christ-like Christian that God has called you to be. It is long for God's word singularly, as a baby longs for milk and won't settle for anything else. Devote yourself entirely, completely to reading it, to studying it, to applying God's word, and watch what he does in and through you as you live out your salvation here and now while you await the full and final revelation of it. And now, Peter turns from exhorting us to conduct that's fitting for Christians and in Christian community to inviting us to consider the nature of this community which Christ has brought us into and brought into existence. He wants us to understand our identity as this new covenant community in Christ because how we're called to live is a direct result of who we are, our newfound identity and life in Christ. And look at verse 4. He says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. As you come to him, he says. In the original, it's a term used frequently in the Old Testament Septuagint, which is the Old Testament in Greek, and it's used of speaking of someone drawing near to God, to hear him speak, or, or coming into the presence of God in the tabernacle to offer up sacrifices. It's also used in 
the letter of Hebrews in the New Testament as a special term for drawing near to God, in worship of God, for the purpose of worshiping God. In Peter's language here is reminiscent of Psalm 34, 5, where the psalmist says, draw near to him. And it's that same psalm, if you remember from last week, that Peter has just already quoted when he says, if you have tasted the goodness of the Lord, as we saw last week. But here, this as you come to him language, it sets the tone for the string and theme of this section that brings it all together, and it's worship. It's about coming into the presence of God for the purpose of worshiping God. So he's saying, as you come to him, speaking of Christ, a a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. What an unexpected paradox. Uh, Comparing Christ to a stone? Stones are dead. Stones are inanimate objects. Why in the world would you compare Christ to a stone? Well, notice what he says about this stone. He says, Christ is no ordinary stone. Look how he qualifies. He says, he's a living stone. You say, how do you know the living stone Peter's referring to is Jesus? Well, he'll go on to quote three times from the Old Testament text in just a moment, and we're going to see that, to show how Jesus is the fulfillment of these three prophecies about this promised stone. Jesus is the promised stone, and he's a living stone because he is alive and living, having been raised from the dead on the third day. This whole section is loaded with Old Testament imagery. Temple, sacrifices, priesthood, and Peter's quotations of these texts here does nothing but emphasize unmistakably that Jesus is the living stone. He is the living stone. Not a dead stone like what the Old Testament temple was made out of. The old way of approaching God and coming into the presence of God through that building made by hands and of dead stones is gone. Jesus is the new temple. And he is far superior because he is alive. He's the living stone. God lives in him. He is God and he is our temple through which we have direct access to God. And yet sadly, despite him bringing direct access to God, look what Peter continues to say. He says he was rejected by men. And the religious leaders did reject and despise Jesus throughout his entire ministry, didn't they? Culminating in their final act of rejection, handing him over to the Romans to be crucified. A death sentence that even the fickle crowds of Israel, whom earlier sang his praises and adored him and welcomed him, even they began to cheer and ask for. He was rejected by his own people. But... But, look what Peter continues to say. He may have been rejected by humans, but he is precious and chosen by God. What a contrast between the world's evaluation of Jesus and God's evaluation of Jesus. In the world's eyes, he is rejected and despised, worthless, worthy of death. And yet in God's sight, He is precious and chosen to be the redeemer through which people can come to eternal life. To the world, he is not a stone that is worth using to build anything. But to God, he is the living stone. And not just a living stone, but a precious stone, highly valued, esteemed, honored. Chosen by God to be the stone upon which he builds his new covenant community people, the church. And that's what he goes on to say in verse 5. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Wow. Wait a second. Not only is Christ a living stone as the crucified and risen Savior, but we now are living stones. Alive. Having the hope of future heavenly resurrection through him because of Jesus' resurrection. This is the only place in the entire New Testament that we're called stones, or living stones for that matter. We are described elsewhere as God's temple or God's house, right? These are common pictures in the New Testament. 
Now, Peter just picks up on this in a slightly different way. And by way of emphasize, uh, emphasizing, just to share, that we also share in Jesus' resurrection. He's the first living stone. We too, therefore, are living stones, and we are being built up together as a spiritual house. And that word house is often used to refer to God's house. The Jerusalem temple. The temple of God. My father's house, Jesus said. You've turned it into a den of thieves in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. That's common. And this, this imagery, again, of the Old Testament, priesthood, sacrifices, coming near to God, drawing near to God in worship, all in one sentence, makes it undeniably clear that Peter is saying, we are the new house where God dwells. Not just Jesus is the new temple, we are the temple of God. We, the living stones, through our common faith in the crucified and risen Savior, are being built into and constitute the new temple, the new dwelling place of God. I wonder if John the Baptist's words came to Peter's mind as he was writing this. He bluntly warned the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right, that salvation is not a matter of birthright. It's not about physical descendants from Abraham, he says in Matthew 3, 9. No, I tell you that out of these stones, God is able to raise up children of Abraham. And now... God indeed has raised up children as his living stones. And notice how he qualifies the word house and sacrifice is spiritual, he says, spiritual. He's not talking about immaterial, since we know as human beings we are physical, material persons. He's talking about being influenced or dominated by the Holy Spirit, indwelt by sharing the character of the Holy Spirit. And by the sealing of believers with the Holy Spirit in the new covenant, right? That's Ephesians 1. We collectively constitute the temple of God. A spiritual habitation for God that is continuously being built up. We're always under construction. We've never arrived. Which means the beauty of this house is not physical, but spiritual. The beauty of this new and living temple made of people is not inexpensive gold or precious jewels but the imperishable beauty of holiness and faith in our lives, qualities that much more accurately and effectively reflect the glory of God. Christians are a new temple of God, under the influence and power of God, the Holy Spirit. And notice the language he uses too here. It's passive. We are being built. It's not us. It's God doing the building. It's God doing the edifying. It's God doing the growing in and through his spirit in us. It's not us as the primary movers and agents of this wonderful work. No, we're just cooperating along with his spirit in us. And what exactly is God building us up to be? Notice what he says, a holy priesthood. And for what purpose? What do priests do in the Old Testament? They offer up sacrifices. And so as a holy priesthood, we're to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And the term for priesthood is found only here and in verse 9. Nowhere else in the New Testament. This language of holy priesthood is an allusion to Exodus 19.6, where God promises that if his people are faithful, they will be to him a royal priesthood and a holy nation. And so he's saying as Christians, we are a holy priesthood consecrated and separated to God, just like the priests of the Old Testament, just like Aaron and his sons in Leviticus 8 to 11. By our conversion and baptism, we are now ready to discharge our priestly function. And yet, as priests, we are not offering up the Old Testament animal sacrifices of the Old Covenant like they did. No. Notice he says, our sacrifices are spiritual Meaning they are offered by virtue of the Holy Spirit operating through us. And what exactly do these sacrifices look like? These spiritual sacrifices. Well, we have some examples in the New Testament. It is the offering of our bodies to God for his service, Romans 12.1. It is the giving of our financial gifts and resources to enable the spread of the gospel, Philippians 4.18. It is the singing of praise to God that is due his name, Hebrews 13.15. And it is the doing and sharing of our possessions with one another, Hebrews 13, 16. And these are just a few examples. A few examples 
that are to encourage us to think about anything and everything that we do in his service as a spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God and a continual sweet-smelling aroma that ascends to his throne and brings him delight. The question is, what do your spiritual sacrifices look like? Are you offering up any spiritual sacrifices? Are you offering up your body in service to him as a spiritual sacrifice, setting yourself apart, sanctifying yourself so you're ready to be used by him for all of his good purposes? Or are you doing whatever you want with your body? Giving it over to sin, to self-gratification, rather than giving it to service to him? Or what about the giving of your financial gifts? to support the proclamation and advancement of the gospel. Because this is a spiritual sacrifice that we're called to offer up to God, and it's pleasing to God. It's probably one of the easiest ones to brush aside, if we're honest, isn't it? We can say, ah, well, I don't have enough money this week or this month. I'll see how next month plays out. I'll try again later. Even though you budget $100 $100 a month for TV and music streaming, right? Netflix, Disney, Hulu, uh, Apple Music, ESPN, Spotify, cable TV. Or we budget $300 a month for eating fast food, going out to restaurants, movies, and entertainment. Or we never fail to upgrade our iPhones to the latest and greatest every September at the latest rollout. Or... We only give that amount that's left at the very end of our monthly budget, right, in terms of priorities, when all the bills have been paid and all the fun has been had and all the stuff has been bought. At the bottom of the pan. Yeah, he says supporting the gospel, supporting the proclamation and advancement of the gospel and all the work of the ministry is a spiritual sacrifice that is pleasing and acceptable to God. And when we do it, it reaches him like a sweet-smelling fragrance and aroma. What about the sharing of your possessions and gifts with one another? Do you share of what God has given to you with one another? Or do you hold on to it tightly for dear life? There's no way I'm letting him or her get their hands on this. This is mine. And not just money. It could be anything. A house, cars, clothes, whatever that is that you cherish and value, that you refuse to share with one another. Or the singing of praises. The singing of praises that God is more than worthy of, as majestic, as mighty, as glorious, as exalted, as good, as faithful, as true, as gracious, as loving, as merciful, as all-powerful, as all-knowing God? Are we withholding that from him? And I'm not talking about just gathering together once a week on Sunday and singing a few songs of worship to him. No, I'm talking about a lifestyle of praise. I'm talking about us being so enamored with Jesus, so focused on Jesus, always remembering the sweetness of Jesus and the goodness of Jesus that we tasted the moment he saved us and that we continue to experience in Jesus, that his praise is never far from our lips, out loud when we can, yes, but in our head when we can't. It's an attitude and a lifestyle of praise. That's a sweet-smelling fragrance and spiritual sacrifice to God. And the fact that Peter here calls us a holy priesthood, it just confirms what we call the the New Testament doctrine, the New Testament teaching of the priesthood of all believers. The priesthood of all believers. There's no longer an elite priesthood restricted to the tribe of Levi that can claim special access to God, special privileges in worshiping God, or special fellowship with God. No, everyone who comes to God by faith in Jesus now has direct access to God because of the cross and resurrection of Jesus. Everyone. Every believer is able to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God, notice, through Jesus, he says. Every believer is able to draw near to God and should have the confidence to approach God and his throne of grace through Jesus. And to prove this, Peter goes on to quote 
from three Old Testament passages concerning this stone to solidify for his readers and to us beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is Jesus. Look what he says in verse 6. He says, for it stands in Scripture, by which he means it is written in Scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This is a quote from Isaiah 28, 16, the prophet Isaiah where God promises a new work in which he's going to reject the rebellious leaders in Jerusalem, and he's going to establish as a sure foundation a cornerstone chosen and precious. The cornerstone was the first stone laid as the corner of a foundation in construction terms. That was the first one you laid. And from it, all the lines were set straight in the whole building. The building depended completely on it for its shape, for its integrity of structure, that's the cornerstone. And Peter's saying the entire building, the church, us, takes its shape from him, the cornerstone. And notice the emphasis is on God's doing again. He says, I am laying. That's God speaking in the first person. Just as it has been throughout this whole section on God's choosing, right? Jesus to be the cornerstone and the living stone, us to be living stones. God is the one who's doing the building. It's all of God. And he says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Kind of a strange way of putting it. He's saying they'll not experience the disappointment, the embarrassment, the dishonor of the judgment of God on that final day. No, they'll experience the glory, the honor of final approval. They will be honored, whoever believes in Jesus. And that's exactly what he continues to say, but not for those who do not believe. Look at this amazing contrast. He says, so the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word. He's saying, conversely to you believers, those who disbelieve will face shame and dishonor on that last day. And they will be dishonored and ashamed because the stone that they disregarded as valueless, worthless, has become the very chief, most precious cornerstone of the entire building. And the second part of verse 7 there is another quote. It's from Psalm 118.2, and it's often quoted in the New Testament, including in Matthew 21.42 and in Acts 4.11, where the builders in those contexts are the Jewish leaders who rejected Christ. The cornerstone. And now Peter's saying it's not just them. He's applying it to everyone who rejects Christ. And the point of the quote is to show that those who reject Christ will be proved exactly wrong by God's exaltation of him to the place of greatest prominence, the head of the corner, the cornerstone. In verse 8, it's more of an allusion rather than a direct quote from the Old Testament. It's from Isaiah 8, 14. He's saying, Jesus, that stone that sits at the head of the corner, is the one over which disbel the disbelieving stumble and fall. And then he adds this interesting commentary at the end of verse 8. They stumble because they disobey the word. A stumble can mean literally tripping over something and falling. But it's got a more figurative sense here, a sense of taking offense at something and rejecting, falling and missing God's way is the idea. And the word for disobey there is really the opposite of obey. It's to not obey. But it actually goes beyond that sometimes, and it has a connotation of active, willful, entrenched opposition to God's word. So Peter's saying they fall... Because they willfully, actively disobey the message, notice he says. What message? The logos. The same word, that the gospel that he's been using as the seed to cause people to be born again to new life and to grow and to nourish us as we saw at the end of chapter 1. It's that same word. They willfully, actively disobey the gospel. And here's the part that's going to make some of us uncomfortable. The stumbling of unbelievers over the cornerstone is not accidental. 
Like we accidentally often trip while walking, going downstairs. Or in the case of our president, going up the stairs of Air Force One. <laughs> this is not accidental. Notice what he says in verse 8. He says, they stumble because they disobey the word, the gospel. Why? As they were destined to do. The verb translated destined here in the New Testament always refers to God appointing something to occur, ordaining something to occur. So God has not only appointed that those who disobeyed the word would stumble and fall, he has determined that they would disbelieve and stumble. And this idea of calamity or evil also comes from God is often taught in the Old Testament, by the way. I know this is shocking to some of you, so let me give you a few examples from Scripture. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? Lamentations 3.38. When a trumpet sounds in a city, do not people tremble? When disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? Amos 3.6. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. Isaiah 45, 7. The worldview of the scriptures is that God is sovereignly in control of all things, from the deliberate decisions made by kings to the seemingly chance-based throwing of the dice. Even the cruelest and most vicious act in history, the execution of Jesus of Nazareth, the innocent, spotless, stainless Son of God, was predestined by God. That's what Peter says when he's preaching in Acts 2 and Acts 4. That was predestined by God. However, just because God is sovereign over all things, history, redemption, it does not exempt human beings from our own responsibility, even though we believe that God ordains all things. In fact, in that same context, in Acts 2, where Peter affirms as he's preaching to them that it was according to the predetermined plan of God that they handed over Jesus to be crucified, he indicts them. Yes, it was according to the predetermined plan of God, he says, but you're nevertheless guilty, he says. Why? Peter indicted them because in killing Jesus, they carried out their own desires. God did not coerce them into crucifying Jesus against their wills. No, in putting him to death, they did exactly what they wanted to do. And so Peter here is doing nothing but articulating a common theme in the scriptures, that human beings are responsible for their sin, and we sin willingly, even though it is God who sovereignly controls all actions and all events in history. And the scriptures do not resolve how this, this these tension, these two truths fit together. I know it's hard to swallow, and it's even harder to comprehend. You say, this doesn't seem morally right. How can God do that? How could God destine that something happen through the willful choice of his creatures, yet himself remain free from blame and not be the author of sin in the sense of actually him doing the wrong? And you're not alone in asking this question. It's the same question that Paul's hypothetical questioner asks in Romans 9, 19, where he really articulates this, this truth, these doctrines, uh, in an amazing way between God's sovereign choosing an election, predestining some for salvation, and those who are destined for wrath and judgment. And he says this, that hypothetical questioner, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? No one can resist his will, right? Right? And look at the answer that Paul gives to his hypothetical questioner in the following verse, in verse 20. He says, Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? There's a tension here. We don't have all the answers in Scripture. We know it teaches both. On the one hand, God is sovereign in salvation, and on the other hand, we are responsible to willfully choose to repent, to turn away from our sin, and to choose Jesus, to choose to believe in him and to follow him as our God and Savior. We must make that choice. And yet we can't make that choice unless he regenerates us. 
unless he produces faith in our hearts by his spirit. And so there's a difference with this language. Notice it says, even here in 1 Peter 2, he destined them not to believe. There's a different language, even the way God describes believers. You see this, it's the uniform teaching throughout the New Testament, even in the Old. Words like predestination, election, they're inescapable. Chosen, as we've been seeing throughout here. In the active sense, it's always described as God actively saving, predestining, electing, choosing, calling. But on the negative side of things, it's never said that God does it actively, even in those Old Testament calamity or evil examples. It's God who brings it about passively. Do you see the difference? Even in that context in Romans 9, he talks about God passively preparing those beforehand for wrath. He's not actively doing the evil. Like he's actively doing the saving. Does that make sense? There's a difference. He's never described as the one actively committing evil. Never. We actively commit evil. The greatest evil, as we saw, which was handing over Jesus Christ to be crucified. We call that reprobation, by the way, when we talk about theological terms, where God passes over some. It is in his sovereign purpose to pass over some, leaving them in their rebellion, leaving them in their sin, which ultimately will result in eternal judgment. But why does Peter emphasize the theme of God's sovereignty here? Why is he doing this for his original readers in that context and for us? Remember, they were experiencing suffering. They were going through hardships. They were being persecuted for their witness, for the cause of Christ. Evil was happening to them. Calamity. So he's telling them this. He wants them to remember that even though this evil has come upon them, it's all according to God's sovereign control. God still reigns, even over those who oppose him, even over his people to whom Peter is writing, and even over us today. But we're responsible. We must choose We must willfully choose. Yes, I can't do that unless God quickens the will, takes up my rock-hard heart and gives me a heart of flesh to believe. We call that regeneration, right? The work of the Spirit. But I'm still called to choose. And we're still called to preach. That's the invitation. We don't just preach to unique people who have a big E stamped on their back like Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, would say. If I knew who was the elect, I wouldn't waste my time with those who are never going to respond. I'd just focus on those who I know are going to respond to the gospel and believe. We don't know who that is. God knows. But we're called to preach to everyone. And so the, the doctrine of God's sovereignty and salvation should compel us to evangelism because we know God will absolutely save whom he said is saving love on in eternity past. They will come to him whether immediately when I preach the gospel or down the road after planting those seeds and God in a moment of salvation converts them years down the road, even on their deathbed perhaps. We never know when he's going to work. But we know this is true. We are responsible to choose. And so we must choose. That's the only way, he says, not to be put to shame, to disappointment, to embarrassment, to judgment on that last day. We must believe. That's all we must do. There's nothing else you can do, humanly speaking. This is the gospel of grace. It's not about my earning God's favor or meriting it. No, I know I'm born into sin. I'm wicked. I'm totally depraved. The only way for me to be forgiven and to be reconciled with God and at peace with God is by faith in Jesus. Not good works. Not sacraments. Not baptism. Not communion. Not any of these things. Those are wonderful and those are ordinances that we must do, but that's not what we're saved through. Those are not the means of salvation. Those are the symbols. The means of salvation is the cross of Christ. That is all. Once for all sacrifice. The only way today to have direct access to God. The only way to avoid disappointment on that final day. And believe you me, there's going to be a lot of people who are disappointed on that final day. Because they were deceived. In their unbelief. False religion. Whatever the case is. No, there's only one way. And that way is belief and faith in Jesus. Jesus. 
And look what he continues to say now in closing this, this unit of thought in verse 9. He says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You see that predestining and electing language, again, as we have been throughout this whole section, chosen, you are a chosen race. Those who stumble and disobey the gospel are destined to, but you are chosen to believe. And he's just restating what he's already said in more illustrative terms about their new identity and purpose, right? Priesthood, royal. Peter conveys these privileges of belonging to God's people with all these Old Testament allusions. We are a chosen race, a people, a nation. That's what that word means, genos. A royal priesthood, chosen by and belonging to the king of kings, Jesus, again alluding to Exodus 19.6 as he did earlier. A holy nation, meaning we're set apart for God's saving and redemptive purposes, enjoying his special presence and his special favor, all for his own possession. Now, we are God's kingdom of priests, the church of Jesus Christ. And we have a similar purpose to Israel in the Old Testament. Look at the rest of verse 9. Why did he choose us to be his own possession, a holy nation, a royal priesthood? To proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Wow. Like Israel, we are to mediate God's blessing to the nations as we proclaim the gospel. God has chosen a new race of people, Christians, who have obtained membership in this new chosen race, not by physical descent from Abraham, but by coming to Christ and by believing in him. Just as believers are a new spiritual race, a new spiritual priesthood, we're a spiritual nation, which is based neither on ethnicity or geographical boundaries. It's based on nothing but solely our allegiance to our heavenly king, Jesus Christ, who is truly the king of kings and lord of lords. That's the purpose for which he chose us, to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And to declare God's excellencies is to speak of all that he is and all that he's done for us. That's what it means, to declare God's excellencies. What a word. What a word. We're to declare his, his excellencies, all of his perfections, of his being, to anyone and everyone. That's the purpose for which he called us and chose us to be royal priests in a holy nation. And as God formed Israel to praise him, so us, the church, has been established to praise him and to proclaim him and his wonders. And the proclamation of God's praises is through worship, it's through evangelism, through spreading the good news of God's saving wonders to all people. That's what Peter has in mind here. We proclaim God's praises for calling us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. We see that a lot, that picture in the New Testament. Conversion is often depicted in the New Testament as a transfer out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. God's marvelous light, he says. This is not no normal light. This is marvelous. This is illustrative. This is magnificent. And we exist to herald and to praise God for who he is and what he's done for us. If anyone ever asked you what your purpose in life is as a Christian, that's your response reduced to one sentence. To praise God for who he is and what he's done for me. And then he closes with this in verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And this is just another Old Testament illusion. It's saturated with Old Testament references here, this time from the prophet Hosea in chapter 2, verses 23. In Hosea, Israel's repudiated as, as God's people because of their sin, their apostasy, they're unfaithful to God's covenant. But God pledges to have mercy on them again and again and again and to reform them as his people. And the theme in Hosea is, is the rejection of Hosea's unfaithful wife and her children and then the reception over and over again as a picture of God's abundant forgiveness and grace towards Israel. 
Yet unlike Israel, we as Christians in the church, we never experience unfaithfulness to a covenant. But we do realize that we too were once outside God's favor, rejected, not a people, nobodies, nowhere. Once we were not a people, because the people of God was a term reserved exclusively for Israel in the Old Testament. He's saying, but now, as Christians, we are elect. We are God's elect. We're not just a people of God. We are the people of God. All by the creative, restorative mercy of God, we who were formerly not a people are now the people of God. From nothing to something. It reminds me of a story that's tangentially related simply by those two words alone, not by the phrase nothing and something. A few months ago, I was at home hanging out with the fam, and the youngest one, Viv, she's only two and a half at the time, she's like, um, I'm Ersty, I'm Ersty. She, she can't properly pronounce or enunciate. She says, I'm Ersty. And Ev, being the smart aleck that she is, a little older, she says, she looks at her with like the sass. She's like, Ersty is nothing. Thirsty is something. <laughs> Just like that. And where'd she even get that from? From nothing to something. And it's incredible to think about. But we as Christians, the church, God's new covenant community people, comprised of both Jews and Gentiles, people of all nations, all backgrounds, all circumstances, all ethnicities, all walks of life, we are all realizing almost all of the blessings that were promised to Israel in the Old Testament. And notice all of this. Through Christ. We were called out of nothing, spiritual darkness, to something far greater, light, spiritual illumination, salvation, and newness of life through Christ. The dwelling place of God is no longer the Jerusalem temple. We are the new temple of God in which God is pleased to dwell through Christ, the cornerstone. We are the true priesthood. And we have direct access to God, and God accepts our sacrifices through Christ. We are God's chosen people, the people of God, his own possession, through Christ. We are God's holy nation, set apart by faith, through Christ. And we have been given all these privileges so that we would proclaim the excellencies and the riches and the wonders and the mercies and the love of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ to the watching world who desperately needs to know him. The greatest rags to riches story in human history is us. Because God took us from nothing to everything through Christ.